excited we're going to have this room for all our events from now on. So, uh, such a wonderful, wonderful room. And somewhat appropriate to have a debate here about copyright and books uh, in the Library of Congress, which is the, obviously the, the cornerstone of, of, of books and literature in the world. So uh, what I'm going to do, the format today, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Daniel Castro. Daniel is a senior analyst at ITIF, and he will uh, introduce our four speakers, which we really appreciate them coming and attending today. Uh, Daniel will give about, a, about eight minutes, ten minutes of overview just to describe the debate. You're probably pretty familiar with it, but it's probably worth just a quick refresher on what this debate is all about. And, uh, and then he'll ask each of the panelists to give a five-minute presentation or discussion, and then he'll ask some questions, we'll have some debate. We should have plenty of time for your questions or comments, uh, and we will adjourn precisely at uh, 3.30. So with that, I'm thank you again.
Our third speaker is uh, going to be Alan Inouye. Dr. Inouye is the Director of Office of Information Technology Policy for the American Library Association. He's also the Director of the Program on America's Libraries in the 21st Century. Before this, Alan served as the Coordinator of the President's Information Technology Advisory Committee and the Coordinator of Information Technology uh, uh, Subcommittee of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Previously, Alan spent a number of years working in the private industry in Silicon Valley. He has a PhD in library information studies from UC Berkeley. And then finally, we're hearing from Peter Brantley, uh, Peter's Director of Access for the Internet Archive. Previously, he was the Executive Director for the Digital Library Federation, Federal Federation? Federation. Federation, a not-for-profit international association with large research and government libraries. Uh, he's a regular contributor to the Rhyming Tools Change Publishing Blog and is a member of the Board of Directors for the International Digital Publishing Forum, the Trades and Standards Organization for the Publishing Industry. So we're going to go ahead and turn it over to the All right. Well, first of all, thanks for having us. And uh, looking forward to lots of discussion. In fact, what I'll try to do is just give you a real quick sense, as opposed to going through all the details of the agreement, which I've done a fair amount. Um, uh, give you a sense of you know, why in the end um, Google was excited about the settlement. Um, as, as Daniel described, you know, this was something that um, you know, we still have a disagreement over you know, the original case because Google still felt that what it was doing was okay. Um, still doesn't feel like it's okay, but we were able to put that aside because we realized, and, and this is really when we, when we started this project, we didn't start this project to pick a fight on fair use. We started this project because we wanted to increase discoverability and access to books. And what we found in the agreement was this is something that it could benefit authors and publishers and then increase access to books and discoverability of books. And so that's why we were very excited about the agreement. Um, and at its basic, at the very basic part of the agreement, for me, and now I'm talking you know, kind of personally the way I approach this, um, when I was doing this project, you know, one of the things that I always, you know, found, I would say, bittersweet, was I realized I really feel that full text search is really important, and I think we've seen that that has a real benefit. And um, has been, I don't, I don't think they mentioned it, but as part of our project, or the library project, and we also have a partner program where we get permissions directly from rights holders. And if any of you are on Google Book Search, that's probably most of the books you see when you can page through and it's a new book. That's under permissions. We've got permission from the rights holder. That's not us interpreting fair use. Um, but I realize that, in fact, you know, in what we've been public with is we scan over 7 million books and about 5 million of them. Um, currently, we can only show these three snippets because that's what we believe fair use allows us. Um, and at some level, it's really disappointing because you realize what you'd really like to be able to do is not just see three snippets. I mean, when, I suppose you went to the web, but when you click through, you actually can't get to any of the pages. You just know that there's a page that may be good for you, and if you would fill out an interlibrary loan form and wait three days, you'll get the web page, and then you can figure out if that's actually the web page you want. Um, that wouldn't be a very engaging experience that we'd all be jumping up and down about. And for me, I still felt like even though search and discovery was really good and really helpful, even if we prevailed in our disagreement, really I think what everyone in this room would like is a world where, and I talk about um, you know, my son, when he goes to school, he's seven now, um, back when I was an undergrad, I remember going up to the stacks and coming back with a stack of books this big and then sitting there and copying some. Um, and bring some back to my dorm. And I spent as much time trying to find the stuff I was going to read, and then it'd be time to actually do the report. I'm like, shoot, I don't have any time to actually read this stuff. Um, and so it was a lot of work to discover the information. Okay, And more and more kids today, you know, if they can't find it easily, they, they mistakenly think it may not actually be there. Okay, And in fact, it is there. It just takes work to find it and work to get it. And I think there's a reasonable future that could have proceeded, especially for all of these in copyright um, works, where my son, when he goes to school in 2020, or 2025, would still be doing the same thing I did back in 1980. And I was real excited, because at its fundamental, I believe there's a, lots of useful information in this content, and I think we all would like to see that content to be discoverable and accessible, 
And another big part about that is, you know, while Google was believing what we were doing was fair under, legitimate under fair use, we've always said that this is about search and discovery, and that when you're providing access to the work, that it needs to be under agreements with the copyright holders. So a framework by which authors and publishers who own the copyright in works can get fairly compensated for that creative um, act. You know, in particular, many of the authors that will benefit, you know, an out of print author, they didn't want the publisher to put the book out of print. Um, so that was one of the things that Google agreed to do as part of this, is to create a, a, a market that can create revenue on behalf of pub authors and publishers. So that's why when we say, we've often said it's a win-win-win, because we feel, you know, uh, you know, from a Google perspective, we're excited about being able to do the search and discovery and access. From a publisher and rights holder perspective, um, they also want people reading their books. And they get to control whether or not their books are read or not. So we give a lot of control to the rights holders. If they don't want their book, they can just tell us that it's not there. And then most important of all users, because in the end, the world we all want to be in is one where 5, 10, 15 years from now, there really is digital access to all of these books. And so um, that's why we're excited. I'm sure we'll get into some of the details uh, about the agreement later on. Thank you. Sure. Um, just a quick preliminary statement. Um, I guess there's probably nothing more pathetic, especially in Washington, than being a lawyer who has to go see his lawyer to discuss whether or not he could speak on a panel. <laughs> but um, as some of you might imagine, uh, with the impending um, court hearing regarding the approval of the settlement agreement, um, there was some concern among some of our team about the possibility of me submitting myself once again to mass cross-examination in a public forum uh, with everybody twittering away to make sure that everything I say is on the record for being reproduced when the court actually considers the fairness of the settlement agreement. But I was told by our, my lawyer that as long as I kept certain responses to uh, an appropriate level of generality, and I mentioned, this is important, uh, the website where people should go to be able to learn about the agreement and to file their claims with respect to it, then this would all be very justified and worthwhile. So let me just quickly mention to you, uh, www.googlebooksettlement.com. That is where you go if you want to get a copy of the rather voluminous documentation of this agreement, uh, as well as the website where you can uh, file claims if you are an author or a publisher of any of the works that are subject to it. And, and if you search on Microsoft or Google Book Settlement, you'll probably also find it. That's right. <laughs> so having said all that, let me just point out the, uh, the context in which this all arose, because I think it's fairly important to understand uh, many people got fixated on the copyright dispute that the authors and publishers had with Google. But remember, uh, this suit was only about one part of the Google Book Search program, and indeed, it was about the part of the program that came later after the program was initially developed. Um, when Google Book Search was first launched, uh, Google came to the publishers, members of my association, said, we'd like to work with you, explain what they wanted to do in terms of scanning works to create a database that would allow them uh, to make parts of these works available online in response to search queries. And guess what? Uh, because they basically came to the publishers and said, so we want to have an agreement with you individually, knowing that you're the copyright owners, they all signed up. Now, why did they sign up? They signed up for a variety of reasons. One was that mass digitization of books was not new. Uh, what was new, of course, was the idea of mass digitization involving copyrighted works, particularly copyrighted works that are still in print. But we had long been seeing uh, folks who had uh, engaged in digitization of works that were in the public domain, making them available online, and the publishing community had, as you might imagine, been wrestling for some time with the question of how they were going to engage in making their books accessible online. It really wasn't a question of if that was going to happen. It was a question of when and how. And of course, publishers are not technologists. So the idea of partnering with one of the premier technologists uh, in the world today actually had a great deal of attraction to the publishers. The problem was that as part of its innovative approach to this issue, uh, from the perspective of publishers, Google crossed the line that was rather important to it. And that was when it announced the library project aspect of Google Book Search where it basically said to our members, even though we have these agreements with you, uh, with respect to which you're going to be able, uh, with your permission, 
to scan your in copyright works into our database and use them as we've discussed. We now also realize that because we want to get every book that's ever been published, we need to find ways uh, to, to create economies of scale in the collection and scanning of those works. So we now have a series of partnerships with major libraries whose collections are going to be loaned to Google, including works in copyright, to be scanned into the database. And this is where the publisher said, well, now, wait a minute. Is that consistent with our original agreements under the partner program of the Google Book Search uh, endeavor? And they found it wasn't, uh, basically because this was no longer requiring permission. Uh, it was being done on the basis of a claim of fair use. Uh, and even though Google generously subsidized, uh, or I should say supplemented, the notion of fair use, uh, with the idea that any copyright owner who wanted their work not to be scanned and not to be included in this database could opt out. The problem for publishers was that's not the way rights of copyright are exploited in, in the world. It's not an opt-out venture, it's an opt-in venture. If it were opt-out, and we agreed that Google was correct in believing that it was opt-out, then basically that would mean that Copyright owners would spend most of their time having to try to find out whether other people were making uses of their works that otherwise would require permission so that they could then go to those people and say either uh, stop or work out some arrangement with us for a license. So we couldn't allow that opt-out notion of the way the exercise of copyright uh, works to go forward. Now, moving forward to the settlement agreement, a lot of people point out to us and say, but wait a minute. Isn't a major part of this agreement uh, and this settlement the idea that Google is going to be able to use many of the works that have been scanned on an opt-out basis? Well, yes, but that's because there's an agreement to do so, an arm's length negotiated agreement where consideration has been given. Not the idea that this is an appropriate construction of the way in which copyright law allows the rights of copyright owners to be exploited. So when you look at the settlement agreement, it accomplished a number of things on, uh, from the perspective of uh, the publishing community. It corrected this notion that um, it was okay for people to go ahead and make uses of copyrighted works that the copyright owner believed required permission, but without obtaining that permission and waiting until the copyright owner learned about it and objected. We were able to, to change that calculus. We were also able to gain the technology part that the publishing community needs if it's going to be able to figure out how books ultimately will be accessible online and how that environment is going to operate uh, in a way that's consistent with copyright and also allows the possibility of publishers and authors being able to recoup their investments in the creation of these works uh, and also possibly for those that are in the business for to make a little bit of money. But at the same time, we feel that we've done some good in this settlement agreement. Uh, once we were deeply involved in these rather painful extended negotiations, there were a number of points where we thought that things could be done that benefited the public generally, not just the, the authors, not just Google, not just the publishers. Uh, and as you look at this agreement, I think there are a number of areas where that's quite palpable. Uh, one of the things that, that I was involved in that was a wonderful opportunity was the idea to deal with uh, issues of accessibility for individuals who have print disabilities. They're either blind or visually impaired or for some other physical or organic dysfunctional reason cannot make use of standard printed materials the way people ordinarily do. Well, you'll find in this settlement agreement that there is a major leap forward uh, in the opportunity for millions of books to be accessible to people with those problems. So I want you to keep that in mind as we're talking about why the settlement agreement uh, uh, came to be and what the settlement agreement basically does, not only for the parties, but for the public in general. Thank you. Uh, okay, th thank you very much. And thank you to uh, ITIF for getting this room for us. Uh, it's kind of a uh, sentimental for me in a way. My first job in Washington was at the National Academy of Sciences. And I uh, ran a study on, on the Library of Congress called the uh, Digital Strategy for the Library of Congress. So I actually spent 18 months in LC, uh, mostly in the Madison building, but I did escape over here every now and then. So I like libraries, which is good since I work at ALA. Um, so I'm here today on behalf of ALA, obviously. Uh, 
but also on behalf of the Association of Research Libraries and the Association of College and Research Libraries. And collectively, uh, we represent uh, over 139,000 libraries in North America. And today I'd like to talk about our brief that will be forthcoming fairly shortly. Uh, so I might get into a little more detail than, than the prior panelists, if you'll indulge me. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, these three associations, which I'll term the library associations, uh, we are both authors and publishers of books. Therefore, we are within both subclasses of, of the plaintiffs. And we'll be actually calling comments on the proposal as both uh, members of both subclasses. Uh, so our perspectives are, of course, from the uh, point of view of, of libraries, our missions and values of libraries. So we really agonized over this proposed settlement. Uh, because on the one hand, of course, there is unprecedented access to information according to the public. I mean, no one can really deny that. Uh, I mean, it's really incredible, uh, particularly the uh, improved searching and indexing capability and just access to information. Now, of course, it's not all things to, to everyone in the library world, uh, because it doesn't replace uh, some functions, such as the preservation archival function. For example, most of the books in this collection will not have photographs or other images. So it's not like, well, we have, we have this digital copy and now we don't have to worry about digitizing this stuff anymore. That's not true. Uh, but it does afford tremendous improved access to the public. Uh, on the downside, though, we find serious issues within the settlement that compromise basic values of uh, privacy, intellectual property, uh, intellectual, intellectual freedom, excuse me. Uh, equality equity, and equity. Uh, so the bottom line in our submission is that we're going to urge the court to exercise vigorous oversight of this agreement. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. So I'd like to raise just a few of the issues that, uh, that will be in our brief. Uh, one concern is con concentrated control. So obviously this, this service, or whatever you want to call it, this tool, um, it's going to be a very, it's likely to become a very valuable resource for, for people looking for information. Uh, may, well come, may well come to be considered an indispensable research tool. Uh, but the settlement gives Google and the book rights registry enormous control over this facility. And so we're very concerned about that. Uh, so that's one of our, one of our key points. Uh, another point is on the pricing of the institutional subscriptions. Uh, so, the, so the settlement establishes detailed procedures by which Google and the book, Books Rights Registry will set the price for these subscriptions. And indeed, the stated objective is the realization of broad access to the books by the public. And so, of course, we applaud this, this, this uh, phrase to be included in, in the settlement. Uh, but the pricing is going to be determined by comparable products and services. And so, of course, the question is, well, what there really aren't any comparable products and services. So we're not really sure what this means. Uh, and there's various other procedures of how pricing will be derived in, in the settlement. Uh, but there's no mechanism for the larger public to challenge whether broad access to the books by the public is being achieved or not. So again, that's another reason why we're, look, we're asking the court to provide careful oversight, is that to make sure that what's actually in the settlement is indeed carried forth. Because there are actually some some hooks in there to ensure that the public interest is taken care of. Uh, we're also concerned about the high needs inequalities of libraries. So in terms of this institutional subscription, uh, you know, major research libraries have the wherewithal to deal with this pay-for-service much better than a small public library. Now, of course, there are going to be these free public terminal provided, uh, but that only provides kind of a first level of access. Um, I mean, we're, we're pretty sure that people are going to want much more access than what's supported by these terminals. And so, you know, the bottom line is libraries are going to be paying for the service. And so we're concerned about this differential access in terms of the, you know, the, the house and the library world will have much, will be much better able to cope with this than, than the have nots. Uh, and in particular, the, the K-12 world, the school libraries are not included at all in this agreement. So that's another concern of ours. Uh, we're also concerned about user privacy. Uh, the bottom line there is that there really doesn't seem to be anything said in this settlement about the rights of the users. 
but there's paragraph upon paragraph upon paragraph upon paragraph about security and securing the rights of the rights holders and protecting the digital content. And we're all for protecting digital content. That's not, not, you know, that's not what, where we're going here, is that you, you know, user privacy is really important too. And there, we didn't really see anything in settlement about that. So that's quite troubling to us. Uh, and so the, the absence of privacy measures also has a telling effect on, on intellectual freedom. If you're doing research or whatever, and you're, and you're not sure about privacy in terms of your transactions, then that's really going to limit what kind of inquiry you're, you're going to make. So that's another concern. Uh, the last concern is on trustworthy innovative services. Uh, the settlement allows the registry to license right holders uh, to license these rights to third parties. But there's no requirement or it doesn't really talk about what terms that this will be done. So the registry, for example, could refuse to license the rights to Google competitors on terms comparable to, the, to those provided to Google itself and the settlement. So that's, in a nutshell, those are our concerns about the settlement, or at least the, the key concerns. Um, I'll brief one through a few other things, but these are the, the main points. And the bottom line is, as I said before, is asking the court to exercise vigorous <coughs> authority and oversight over, over the settlement. And we have six particular recommendations which I'd like to share with you at this time. Uh, so one is uh, any library or other possible institutional subscriber <coughs> must have the ability to request that the court review the pricing of an institutional subscription. Uh, Two, any entity must have the ability to request the court to review the registry's refusal to license copyrights to books in the same terms available to Google. Number three, any user must have the ability to request this court to direct Google to provide a list of books excluded from any of its services for any reason with an explanation. Number four, any researcher must have the ability to request that the court review the refusal of a researcher to conduct research at a host site. Number five, any user must have the ability to request the court to direct Google and the registry to disclose their policies regarding protecting personally identifiable information and whether they are in compliance with these, that is, their own policies. And finally, the court should be diligent, vigilant, as the settlement's implications, implications may be far-reaching and fully not knowable. So exercise of other oversight within the framework of the settlement may be necessary over time. Well, the simple point that these are, these are what we work in today, but the value of this important resource is going to continue for many years. And the Books right, Rights Registry at Google will continue for many years, and obviously other issues will emerge, so the court needs to, to maintain oversight to, to, to monitor what, how this resource and how it's being used is changing over time. So in summary, we do not oppose approval of the proposed settlement, uh, but we're troubled by certain aspects of it, and we believe that uh, careful court oversight can address many of our concerns. Thank you. Um, uh, let me go ahead and turn it over to Peter. Uh, we hear a few uh, concerns I think that have been expressed, and then we'll have the dialogue back and forth. Great. Thank you. Uh, everybody can hear me okay? Um, so, faced with the odd situation of leaving 95 degree weather for more pleasant weather in D.C. marginally um, to a bizarre heat wave on the West Coast. Um, but it's great to be here. Uh, I seem to be spending more and more of my time in D.C. Um, even though my prior job at the Chicago Library Federation, um, our offices were on N Street, um, a 50 pound circle, um, such as state. So what I'm gonna do here is uh, actually oddly something that I very rarely do, which is uh, read out from a uh, piece of paper that I uh, handed out to you, because it's basically the draft of, a, of an op-ed. And, and then from there, uh, I'm gonna um, just draw a couple of our own conclusions. Um, I you know, wanna alert you if you haven't been aware that uh, we have filed a motion um, with the court uh, to intervene as a party defendant. So, um, we do have an action uh, in front of SDNY right now. Um, and um, I also would note that, contrary to my good colleagues um, in uh, the Library Association's 
um, we weren't that conflicted about this. Yeah. Um, we have very definite uh, opinions about this, and I'm happy to share them with you today. I also want to note that I do have some experience uh, or history um, with Google Book Search as it's now non known. Um, um, I helped uh, negotiate the contract between Google and the University of California um, years ago, and uh, certainly um, stayed involved and interested in the proceedings uh, between Google and the libraries as well as the publishers at the beginning of the time. So, a court in the Southern District of New York will soon decide whether to approve a proposed settlement in a landmark case that could determine our digital future. The settlement is a result of lawsuits filed in 2005 against Google by groups representing authors and publishers claiming that Google's book scanning project violated copyright. When Google announced the scanning project in December 2004, the company said its goal was simple yet far-reaching. Like its web search engine, which points people to websites, Google's book search product would help people find information in books and in turn direct them to volumes in libraries and bookstores. Indeed, the project seemed perfectly in keeping with the guiding principles of the web itself, which assumes a quid pro quo between search engines and websites. That is, sites allow themselves to be copied and indexed as long as search engines like Google's lead people back to the original site on the web. But as we learned last October, when the proposed settlement was announced, Google's ambitions are far larger. As it turns out, Google search tool has become a digital bookstore. The settlement outlines business models for creating and selling electronic editions of books and selling subscriptions to Google's new exclusive library. Whereas the original lawsuit could have helped us define fair use in the digital age, the settlement has given us something very different. It is a new and unsettling form of media consolidation. If the settlement is approved, the outcome will be not one, but two court-sanctioned monopolies. Google will now have permission to bring under its sole corporate control that which has for centuries been made accessible through public institutions. In essence, Google will be privatizing our libraries. It may seem puzzling that a civil lawsuit could yield monopolies. Traditionally, class action lawsuits cluster a class of persons who have suffered the same kind of harm as a result of alleged wrongful conduct. And indeed, under this settlement, authors who come forward to claim ownership in books scanned by Google will receive $60 per title, or up to $60 per title. But the troubling aspect of the settlement, the part that gives rise to monopoly, is that it has created a class that includes millions of people who will never come forward. For the vast majority of books considered orphan works, no one will claim ownership. Perhaps the author has died, the publisher has gone out of business, or doesn't respond to inquiry, or the original contract has disappeared. According to the settlement, Google, and Google alone gets an explicit perpetual license to scan and sell access to these in copyright but out of print orphans, which make up an estimated 70% of books published after 1923. No other provider of digital books will enjoy the same legal protection. The settlement also creates a new entity called the Books Rights Registry, which in conjunction with Google will set prices for all commercial terms associated with digital books. Broad access is the greatest promise of our digital age. But giving control over such access to one company, no matter how clever or popular, is a danger to principles we hold dear. Free speech, open access, to knowledge, and universal education. Through history, those principles have been realized in the nation's libraries, publishers, and the legal system. There are all alternatives to Google's approach. Separate from the Google effort, hundreds of libraries, publishers, and technology firms are already digitizing books with the goal of creating an open, freely accessible system for people to discover, borrow, purchase, and read millions of books. It's not that expensive. For the cost of 60 miles of highway, we can have a 10 million book digital library available to a generation growing up reading on screens. Our job is to put the best works of humankind within reach of that generation. Through a simple search on the internet, 
a student researching the life of John F. Kennedy, should be able to find many books from many libraries, many booksellers, not be limited to one private library whose books are available for a fee controlled by a corporation that can dictate what we are allowed to read. We've wrestled with high-tech monopolies in the past, IBM, AT&T, and most recently, Microsoft. The, the lessons we learned were that such strongholds restrict innovation and competition. In those cases, it was the courts that stepped in to address those inequities. Now we have a proposal for monopolies to be created by the courts. The court should not approve the settlement. Monopolies will hinder, not help us, achieve a rich and democratic digital future. Laws and the free market can support many innovative, open approaches to lending and selling books. We need legislation to address books that are caught in copyright limbo. And we need to stop these monopolies from forming so that we can create vibrant publishing environments. We are very close to having universal access to all knowledge. Let's not stumble now. Let me close by saying the archives would like to remove orphans from this settlement proposal. If the parties between rights holders and Google would like to form an agreement over works whose rights holders are known, then they may proceed forward either as a class action or a set of private contracts. But the orphans have no one to speak for them, and we want them out of the settlement. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I assume David is going to respond to this, so I'll start with a question directed to you on this topic. Uh, an important aspect, as Peter's mentioned, of the settlement is that Google now has access to orphan works, and there's not another entity that could come in there and, and do something similar. Um, if another group did this, they'd be exposed to the uh, same risk of using more than work that Google was exposed to when you were sued. Um, so the Books Rights Registry can only license my understanding going forward, uh, books where the copyright owner has opted in. So is this a very good competition, or is this just a person who would advantage uh, of doing it? Um, and, and, and I think it's a good question. In fact, I'm going to focus on that question. I think Peter had some rather large and bombastic other claims, but I think focusing on that issue, which I think is well articulated, I think that relates to um, some of Alan's questions about the Books Rights Registry and the degree to which they may um, uh, license to other people. I think, Alan, you may, we should come to that and you can answer that. So, um, uh, so first of all, one thing we should realize that, you know, as opposed to um, acting like orphans are all out of print works, it's certainly not the case, um, uh, you know, that in fact, um, you know, our data shows, first of all, that in print works is, you know, a fair number, but a lot of works are in print, and then a lot of out of print works actually are earlier versions of in print works. And then rights certainly still are owned by a number of publishers and a number of authors. Um, and so in fact, there are certainly some works that in the settlement will be unclaimed. Now, which of those are actually orphans, nobody knows, which is one of the challenges with orphan works. Um, and one of the things we all have to be aware of is it's not like something, when someone claims it, it suddenly is no longer an orphan. In fact, what you discovered was never an orphan. The parents didn't come back to life. Um, in fact, you found who the rights holder was, and in fact, they could be found. So one of the things that we did in this agreement um, is very much think about this in terms of a few things. So first of all, we certainly thought about making it very important that the information about who claims works and that works are claims are publicly accessible and that the registry will be sharing that. Um, and this addresses some of these concerns about both not only their ability to um, the, the rights registry to license stuff, but also for the public to know when someone has claimed a work, okay? Now it is the fact, it is true, that for the orphan works, which will be some percentage of the orphan books, um, uh, and what that percentage is, um, you know, I think it's very hard to estimate how many, what percentage of works are orphans, but I, to me at least 70% seems, you know, off by a or two or more. Um, but there'll be some number of orphan works, and in the settlement, it's a class action lawsuit, and in fact, the um, class action structure does not provide for a court to then allow the registry to grant licenses outside of this agreement, okay? So in this, what we have are unclaimed works, okay, um, that the registry won't be able to grant licenses. Now, we do feel, however, in terms of moving forward on open work legislation, it's very important that, you know, Google has consistently got a strong support of open work legislation. 
Um, we feel having legislation is good. Um, we think by having the creation of, um, uh, of the database of what's out there, A, it helps in being more proactive about getting good legislation because now one of the biggest problems with the work legislation is nobody was putting up the money to go out and build a database of all the books that work for them. And so by building this database, it helps because now if you think about maybe orphan, now just because it's not plain doesn't mean it's necessarily orphan because it, maybe they just didn't claim it. But now if you want to do something, okay, um, A, it allows some legislative solutions, and B, um, and this is this question that you were asking, Daniel, about do, are there barriers to entry? So, Google still believes that what we've been doing in terms of indexing and scanning is fair use, and in fact, they're still doing it for other stuff not covered by the settlement. So we still believe that other rights holders can come forward and can be scanning books and indexing them, okay? And to the extent there's no rights holder there, the thing about copyright is someone needs to enforce it. And one thing that any rights holder can do is find out, did anyone claim this work? And to the extent no one claimed that work, okay? then they can take that into account in terms of how, so it actually reduces their liability. And in fact, right now, if someone like the Internet Archive starts scanning works, they don't know what's orphan, what's not, and so they face risks in that. Now they have a database that they can access, they can make determinations. Um, and now in this, we support other solutions that would provide, again, broader access to orphan and broader access to unclaimed works, but that would need to be through a legislative process. When Google entered this, and this is really important. We didn't think that the solution is to lock up the copyrighted content. Okay. And one thing that I think we should get to is Peter saying that um, you know the, the plans about copyright law and how copyright law allows people today to do stuff. It'd be interesting to hear what those plans are because you know our view was we could not provide access to these in copyrighted works in terms of letting people reading them. Um, and under current law. And so we said, we don't think the solution is let's make sure nobody can read this, okay? But we think that this is a practical solution that moves the ball forward, and in particular adds value with lots of safeguards for the public good. And that's what we were focusing on, is that are there safeguards in here to ensure that access and uh, the public good is protected? Peter, did you want to respond? Um, I just want to respond briefly. I, you know, I think Dan used uh, a description of orphan works, which goes into a little bit of detail about what is truly orphan. Uh, so, you know, the, we often in, in these discussions use um, terminology about orphans, and the base discussion is one where there are no known rights holders, and whether or not there is a rights holder for a work is another question. A rights holder can emerge. Um, there can be disputes about the rights holder claims on works and so forth. But for you know, our and our purposes, essentially, we're dividing up works between those that have known rights holders, where there is a rights holder who can make a legitimate claim about the use of a work, and those works which don't have such a rights holder claiming. It's those works we feel should not be part of the settlement. That should not be part of a privately negotiated agreement that belongs in the legislative process. And the archive would support a legislative process that help determine the future of orphan works usage. But we are so cognizant that the world is not just books, and we're seeking solutions that ultimately encompass a wide range of media, books, photographs, illustrations, and movie images. We live in a broader world. And so, you know, that is more the, the cut that we have of known and not known right holders. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, uh, say a point about orphan works legislation. Uh, so you, she used to make the point that, so this settlement affects only books, uh, but perhaps the more difficult orphan works questions are with other media, such as photographs. So if we are going to go down the legislative route, it, it, it's a much more complex question than, than just books. I'm not saying that's not desirable, but it's a, just a big, much bigger question. And the other thing is that what we learned last year in terms of uh, attempts at open works legislation is that uh, there are interests that have want to impose significant uh, requirements on those people who want to make use of orphan works. Uh, for example, the registration of your use of an orphan work, perhaps even paying a fee. Uh, and these are very onerous requirements. So uh, 
uh, I think effective legislation needs to take to, to account what the use is going to be. Uh, from a library perspective, for example, think about creating a digital library of, uh, of a certain culture or period of history or something, and you have you know, boxes of photographs, thousands of them. Uh, it's not practical, practical to go out and find out who those rights holders are if indeed you can. So that's kind of, and, and to register each work and to pay for each registration is just, it's just impossible. And I think that's very good. I mean, it, he raised some of the problems that exist there, and I think we agree that there, there needs to be the, 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 what was in Congress isn't necessarily what would be the right thing from the library community's perspective. Alan, yeah, yeah, can I just add uh, point to this? I mean, I, I'm not sure I understood Peter's uh, distinction in, in dividing the category of orphan works into two parts, the known and unknown. Uh, the thing about orphan works is largely that what you're left with is unknown. Uh, once you have some information about who the copyright owner may be, uh, generally speaking, it's, it's not an often work unless that, that copyright owner simply can't be located, can't be contacted, uh, just, just is, is off uh, you know, the grid in terms of being able to give whatever permissions might be uh, needed to make use of that work. But the other thing about this is, which is very different, and I've been working on the orphan works legislation for three congresses now, um, and, and one thing that I have not seen in any of those discussions or in any of the various drafts we've been working on is something that this uh, settlement agreement does, which is this settlement agreement uh, takes a large piece of money, uh, upwards of $10 million, to actively go out and beat the bushes and say to people, hey, this is an agreement that affects your works. If you have rights to a book, or to what would be considered an insert under this agreement. If you are an author or a publisher with those rights, you may have interests that uh, you, know, you need to vindicate here. And we have not only set up a, a process to beat the bush to try to find these people, but also set up the apparatus where they can claim their rights. Now, all of this is going to result in a substantial, uh, over time, ongoing diminishing of the universe of orphan works as people come forward to claim them. At some point, when the claims stop, we will have kind of a finite universe left of orphan works. It's fairly doubtful that going forward into the future, we're going to be adding to that universe of orphan works, certainly not under uh, this type of an agreement, uh, where there is the ability for anyone who's creating new works to make it clear, at least with respect to books, to make it clear to Google, to make it clear to the Book Rights Registry, to make it clear to the world that they have copyright interests uh, that have to be respected. So we're talking about both um, dealing with the process of orphan works in a way that hasn't even been suggested and is not likely to be addressed in legislation that's going to reduce that universe uh, and it's not going to be added to in the future. Now, all of this doesn't preclude Congress from enacting orphan works to address the other kinds of copyrighted works besides books, to address the problems of images, photographs, things that were not capable of being addressed under the settlement agreement, unless we brought in another four or five rights advocacy groups to participate in the negotiation for those works. Uh, but the simple fact of the matter is, is that in terms of the public interest, in being able to diminish the universe of orphan works so that works can be used, uh, and also to be able to use at least one class of orphan works, this agreement uh, is very progressive in allowing both of those things to occur. Let me ask a, a follow-up question uh, related to the orphan works. And I'll direct this first to you, Dan. Uh, and this actually came in from, um, we, we allow people to submit questions for attending and you'll have a chance to ask questions later too. Uh, the book scanned by Google may not just be used for displaying to users. Google can also use it for other purposes, such as improving the search algorithm. Uh, so Scott Phelan, the president of Precursor, wrote in to ask us, uh, do de facto exclusive search and search advertising rights for Google of a strategic searchable digital information set, like Orphan Works, extend Google's dominance in search advertising? So um, and, and let me mention one thing. I think Dan uh, Allen me, uh, raised some question that we should come back to, um, you know, in terms of some of his issues. So let's so, so on that, you know, we were already digitizing these books, and in fact, because of copyright and the fact that, you know, while we felt like we could digitize them, that doesn't mean we could give them to a bunch of other people, okay, or let a bunch of people come in and do research. One of the real benefits, and I know it's one thing that there's been some confusion about that we found in this agreement was the fact that Google is making available the entire corpus 
to, as a research corpus so researchers can come in, whereas currently we are not able to do that because we would be taking liability risk to the extent something goes wrong. And so in fact, we have, we have right now, for example, a database of over seven million books, okay? Um, you know, I can just tell you in terms of does it give us something that, you know, exclusive with search, um, I, I think the answer is no. We have all sorts of data for improving search on the web. There's no shortage of information to do algorithmic work in search. However, we still feel it is useful for doing all sorts of research. Okay, it's not necessarily in search. All sorts of areas, and that's why we felt like the research corpus um, was one of the really big things for the research community, so that for people here understand it, Basically, we're taking all the books we digitize, which includes both input and output. Um, the libraries will be running up to two research corpuses. Um, the participating libraries, the ones that are partners, and they will be responsible for running it. This isn't run by Google, it's not run by the registry. Um, one of the areas that I know has been voice of concern when there's some confusion is the, you know, all you need to do is have some short thing to demonstrate you're doing on the research that what we call in the agreement is non consultative That's a little confusing. But think of it like this. There's certain research when you want to read all the books. You're a historian, you want to read every book about something. Well, that's what the institutional subscription is for. That's what the publisher is selling the book for, is people to read it. There's all sorts of research, which is really computational analysis over the course. Okay, you do all sorts of different things. That's not why the publisher is selling a physical book. And so we wanted to create a corpus where people could do that. Search is an example of that. Um, and so this is going to be run by the libraries for the academic community. We feel it's one thing that will help encourage competition because people can do research over that. Google has no rights to it. They can sell it to whoever they want. They can sell it to Microsoft. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're, we're excited about. Does anyone else want to respond? Um, I just want to respond back to a couple of things that were said by about working works legislation, uh, which is to note an obvious that it almost passed. And um, you know, this is uh, a bill that would, I think, be potentially uh, discussed again uh, in, the, in the near term. So it's not that far away. Yeah. Um, I also wonder now, with, in light of um, the kind of precedent that this might set, um, just how eager uh, photographers would be to uh, go down this particular road. And, and I think there are a lot of reasons that um, they and, and other types of media uh, that had a set of concerns that were very prominent in working works legislation um, might now be more favorably um, inclined to support that legislation. Um, I also want to note that um, you know, what we seek at the archive is a, um, ultimately a, a registry, a registry function that is a public entity, not a privately controlled entity, but a, an entity controlled by authors that um, perhaps or uh, every author engaged and certainly publicly um, publicly guided, publicly charted, um, and, and much more of a public entity than a, an independent or privately um, uh, negotiated court approved organization. Can I just say, I, I'm not sure what your view of a public uh, entity is, but uh, this agreement provides that the Book Rights Registry is going to be incorporated as a not-for-profit entity under the laws of New York State. Uh, which will be just like any other not-for-profit entity that's incorporated under state law. Uh, it's going to have bylaws. Uh, it's going to have a, a certificate of incorporation. It's going to have to comply with the laws uh, within the state uh, that govern how such nonprofit entities are going to be operated. And it provides for a board that is going to share um, representation from appointees from uh, the community of authors and publishers. So, you know, this is not some secret office that's going to be, uh, you know, existing underground. Uh, it's not something that is going to have no accountability to the public uh, for the way it operates. Uh, so I'm just a little puzzled by your concern about that. I'm going to say it a little differently than Alan. <laughs> but in fact, we think that's a great idea. In fact, that's why the registry is a public entity that's controlled by authors and publishers to achieve those goals to satisfy that, which is what is in the agreement. Because it's not a private entity, it's controlled by people at all. I'm not going to touch that one again, except to know that I happen to work at a not for profit too. Yeah. So, why well, don't we move on to it? And copy, I'm sure if there are any more questions on this, let's probably come back to it. But uh, and let me direct this to you, uh, Alan Adler. Uh, one interesting aspect of the settlement is that it covers both US and non US works. Uh, that's to say, the non US authors who use non US publishers. They still have their books digitized um, and made part of this agreement. 
So does this set a bad precedent if a non-US company were to create its own book search project with less favorable terms for authors and publishers? No, I, I don't think that there's an issue about less favorable terms. I mean, the reason that this covers uh, those books is because Google scanning operations uh, with its library partners brought in a variety of works, works that were published in the United States, works that were published abroad, works that were published both abroad and in the United States. Um, and the, the simple fact of the matter is, is that what the settlement agreement focuses on is whether you are someone who has a copyright interest that is cognizable uh, in a book that, that either was uh, scanned by Google or is, is possibly subject to being scanned by Google. So we've been talking with um, publisher organizations and rights organizations and countries abroad uh, to make them aware of the fact that they have rights under this settlement agreement. Uh, they, in some instances, have been a little bit puzzled about how that came to be because we've discovered that uh, the class action mechanism is actually fairly unique to US law. Uh, but nevertheless, once it's explained to them that uh, to the extent they have copyright interests that are cognizable under U.S. law and therefore under the settlement agreement, uh, they are able to file their claims and to exercise their rights, uh, which range from just removing the books completely from this uh, to opting out of the agreement themselves so that there's simply no question that their books are involved, uh, or, as, as I think probably they would find more advantageous, remaining in the class as class members uh, and being able to exercise their ability to control the uses of these works that are made under the various access and revenue models that are provided for in the agreement. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, actually move back to something that Alan had, uh, Alan had brought up before about privacy. Privacy is an important value to many people. Uh, many libraries in the United States have actively worked to ensure the privacy of their patrons and prevent the release of library records and ensure confidentiality. If Google Book Search eventually becomes the primary source for books and other information, will users be able to expect the same level of privacy afforded to them by libraries? And so, in the course, uh, Mr. Paul. Yeah. Alan, did, uh, did you want to expand upon that? Uh, well, sure, why not? Let me say a few things, then you yep. have a few comments, I'm sure. Uh, so, I think I covered that in, in my remarks uh, to some extent. So when you, when you put, well first is the, the purchase of a book, or the purchase of the uh, indefinite license to access a book. Uh, so you have to authenticate yourself, and well first you have to buy the book, obviously, so then you need a credit card transaction, or whatever transaction, uh, and then you have some way of accessing the book in the future, so there must be some kind of authentication. So then the system knows who you are and that you're accessing some book. And so it could track every page you go to, every word, how long you stay there, what pages you don't look at, uh, what, what sequence of pages you, you track. And for those of you who know about the library community and library values, this is completely objectionable to anything that we can tolerate. So that's kind of, that's part of our, our concern about uh, the privacy aspects. Uh, in terms of institutional subscriptions, uh, we also have that concern there, although the written settlement itself uh, at least we didn't find very much that, to address the issue of what kind of privacy or tracking could or might not occur. Uh, maybe I'll just leave it there. Yeah, well, let me, you know, and, and, and Alan, you know, raise the important point that, in fact, you know, the, this envision, this is, you know, envision certain authorizations that we're receiving, okay, but we have the responsibility to build a product and offer it into the market and to have a clear privacy policy and have a clear communication in that market. Because uh, we do think this is a very important um, concern, and that you know we need to be very open about it. Um, so he's absolutely right; it wasn't written into the agreement in part because some of these products, you know, some of them we have an idea of how it's going to work. Some of them we still have to figure it out. One thing that's very important in terms of institutional subscription, and I'll made an important distinction between these two products. For the institutional subscription, the market has already figured out a good solution, and in fact, libraries, and, and this isn't just about. Um, privacy, it's about other of the licensing terms that libraries expect from databases that they subscribe to. Um, you know, libraries have been very clear about what they will and what they won't subscribe to. So, um, for example, in terms of privacy, most libraries use IP authentication, whereas some use shibboleth, but in both cases, the provider of the database does not know the identity of the individual that is using the content, okay? And, you know, we've done, we, you know, for some of the stuff, we've done some planning, and that's one thing is we, you know, it's, it's clear that that's the way we're going to approach 
the institutional market um, because it's the right thing to do. It's the only thing that actually libraries will subscribe to. Libraries are very vigorous in making sure that any products that are offered into that market um, adhere to their requirements with respect to this. So we will conform to those standards in the library market to make sure it meets their needs as we offer product into that market. Um, now you also raised the important point about the consumer um, access. And um, that becomes a, a little more challenging, and Alan appropriately pointed out that the very nature of cloud-based computing, I mean, I'm computing the cloud-based access, is if I can't authenticate you when you come back, well, you know, in other words, basically, you, you, if you buy something from me, you're like, well, if I come back, you better darn know who I am so I can still get my book, because you'll be kind of upset if I forget who you are. I mean, this is the same thing that we can build with Amazon. And some of the points that um, Daniel's raised about, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, we hadn't thought even of the usefulness of the type of, you know, uh, ideas that you suggested, watching every page and how many seconds and all that. We need to form a privacy policy on, um, on that, and we need to come out with that to offer this to the community, and the community should look at that privacy and critique it, because um, we do think that it's important, uh, these issues that they're raising. And it is very important that, um, you know, that, again, in the library community, that this isn't an issue. Um, and I think one of the things to remember here, um, sometimes we talk about this where this is the way everybody here will be reading the books in the future. Um, you know, this is, while well, this deals with imprint books, it's, it's certainly predominantly about out-of-print books, and in terms of new books, certainly Amazon, the Kindle, the publishers, there are so many options out there right now that it's gonna be a very diverse, competitive space in terms of electronic access to books, you have Stanza, you have um, e-reader, you have e-fiction. And so Google almost, you know, we're not even a player in that market. But these are things that we're gonna have to conform. And I think the market needs to evolve too, because I'm sure uh, the concerns that Alan is mentioning here isn't just about Google, it's about Amazon or Stanza or other products in this marketplace. I'm sure he would have the same things to say about it, and that this is something we need to continue that while. Yeah, let me also just quickly say, I mean, the Association of American Publishers is a co-sponsor and leader of the Campaign for Reader Privacy, which for the last eight years has been in an ongoing battle with uh, the United States government uh, over provisions of the Patriot Act that have violated reader privacy. Um, you know, so the fact of the matter is, the existing legal framework uh, and, and the likelihood of that being improved in terms of federal law uh, is something that, that we have been fighting for. It's something that hasn't yet occurred uh, the way we think it should. But there's no reason why, again, the rights of, of readers, whether we're talking about those in uh, usual brick and mortar libraries or those who are accessing uh, library databases online, uh, couldn't be addressed in that manner. Um, one thing that's important to understand about this is, is that you know, this is going to be offered to consumers who will have choices about whether or not they think it makes sense to subscribe, for example, in the case of institutions, to institutional subscriptions, or for individual consumers to take advantage of the ability to purchase things uh, through consumer access. All of that is going to be reflected uh, based upon the policies that are offered. If they don't like uh, the way in which their data is handled by Google, they're not going to be people who are going to be customers of these services. So there is an opportunity here, not just in the context of the process for approving the settlement agreement, but long afterwards, as these services are hopefully uh, offered, for consumers to make clear their concerns, their preferences, and to help shape the way these services are made available. Uh, let me follow up on that. Uh, so can I one, one last question uh, from here, and then we're going to turn over to the audience. Can I follow up on this question? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. OK. Uh, well, first, on the, on the point of consumer choice, uh, there's not like a lot of choices on this kind of service. I'm not too sure about this point. Uh, as far as the privacy issue generally, uh, so Dan raises a lot of good points. and. I mean, we, we kind of know each other from various other sessions and writings and such, and uh, he is a very reasonable person. Uh, but as far as, in terms of this settlement and the court and so on, the only thing we really have is what's in black and white in the settlement and what the judge will do. And everything else are mm -hmm. people's representations of what they will do or might do or should do, and uh, you know, we, we just have to react to what's actually in the settlement. I'm not sure if there's any way 
to go beyond that amount. Yeah, and, well, and even, you know, the court has to make, uh, you know, decisions about what, but part of this independent, it, it, it is, if nothing else, the beginning of a dialogue that is, even aside from what might happen with the court, is an important dialogue as you look at electronic books, new books, Whereas I said, it's not just Google that is making those available, and that in fact, if anything, you know, so how many people have bought a new book, electronic book from Google in the last month, and how many have bought an electronic new book from Amazon in the last month? Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't think we need to see the ratio. This is a question that isn't just unique to Google, and so I think it's part of the dialogue that needs to happen. I'm sorry, I also want to respond on that. I, I think um, it's an amazing statement to say that this is potentially a competitive market if portions are included in the settlement. No one else but Google would have the full range of public domain through Orphan, through in copyright materials. And on cloud computing, um, absolutely I agree. No, uh, we both know that intrinsic to any network-based access, there is an um, opportunity to provide enhanced services through uh, certain kinds of, of user-chosen um, identification management options. Um, with the actions on the user chosen. Um, but I think, you know, what we were all really saying here is that a public statement, um, a document statement by Google about how much data would be retained against whatever books um, are accessed um, and whatever is done with them um, should be part of any negotiated settlement or contract relating to any book viewing online, period, regardless of what any other actor does. And then finally, um, there have been some comments made, and it's certainly within the realm of possibility, uh, that based on uh, particularly in the consumer uh, subscription or consumer purchase markets, um, that Google could conceivably optimize pricing against individual preferences as they've been exhibited through prior history or usage. And having a statement from Google that they would not receive, pursue such pricing optimization on an individual user basis would also be considered useful. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I, I think we're, my question is going to be along those lines, so I think, um, Alan, you probably wanted to respond to it anyway. Uh, the group Consumer Watchdog has opposed the settlement. Uh, as you probably know, they claim that the settlement contains a most favored nation clause that would prevent would-be Google competitors from striking and improved rights to the folks registry. With the settlement, can other organizations compete fairly in the individual book market? And if so, what is the effect on pricing likely to be? Do publishers have an interest in restricting the number of competitors? Uh, this is the type of question, since you're talking about somebody who is seeking to intervene in the case that I have to be somewhat circumspect about responding to directly. But, but let me just say, I mean, you know, one thing to understand about the, the context of this agreement is, is that the publishers are not giving up their businesses. I mean, this is something that is supposed to provide another complementary means of distributing and selling their products. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not betting the whole shop on the idea that from now on, all books are going to be made available in digital form and only become accessible to people online. Uh, that's just simply not the way we see the market at the moment. Um, you know, the, the uh, issue of, of how successful e-books have been, I think is an indication of the fact that for some people, uh, the standard format of ink and print paper books uh, still works quite well. But the simple fact of the matter is, is that the, the MFM provision that was in there was something that was primarily uh, designed to make sure that, from Google's perspective, the idea of reaching an agreement here um, which, which uh, we could all live with was something that simply wouldn't be, in the next uh, instance, circumvented by the same parties with which it had negotiated this agreement, going out and negotiating an agreement that was greatly to the event disadvantage of Google and the one that just negotiated. Now, I know that people have other views about what the MFN provision would do, um, but and that's going to probably be a subject of discussion, I think, quite substantially uh, in the context of the uh, court hearing. And, and let me, and getting into the details of the MFN is a very complex, but it's pretty cabin. It doesn't apply to rights holders that have come forward. And the way I look at it, I always believe in looking at, um, you know, when you question why will someone behave in a particular way, is you want to question what is going to be in the best interest of that organization. Now the registry, as I said, you know, Google doesn't control it. All I'm doing is hypothesizing here, but the registry, First of all, it has no rights with respect to anything published after January 5th, 2009, with respect to Google. 
Okay. Um, and if you, so if you're running the registry, one thing you want to do is create what really does add value in the industry beyond just this agreement. In other words, you don't want to run an organization that 10 years from now is dealing with books of router print prior to this date, because more and more you become less and less relevant. So there's a real challenge out there for the registry to figure out a way to add value to publishers and authors. And I am 100% confident that they will be thinking of ways to license content to Amazon, to Microsoft, to Yahoo, as rights holders come forward, because it's in their best interest to find multiple distribution channels for content Every publisher, what publisher sells their books in only one bookstore? I think it's only the publisher that's owned by Barnes and Noble um, that might do that. And even then, I think they distribute through multiple channels. It's the very nature of publishing that what you do is distribute through multiple channels, and that's the way you're most effective. And you know, in other words, we all need to know what the registry will do. Um, but you know, in other words, it seems to me it's in their best interest, and I think they have every intent to be working with other providers, so that way they become a vibrant and useful and relevant um, part of the world. Well. That assumes that the market is not largely captured through the settlement and the product that you have to find for online book access. You know, you say that the question of capturing the market, and we talked before about there not being competition. The simple fact of the matter is, is that although these revenue models, these access models, have been provided for in a settlement agreement, it is not a foregone conclusion that they're going to be successful. We're going to have to see how they're implemented. We're going to have to see how institutions respond to them. We're going to have to see how the public responds to them. The idea that, that we're putting out something that everybody has to become a customer of just simply isn't true. And, and Alan, you, that part of it is also thinking about where the competition is. Um, how many people here have bought a book in the last three months? Okay, how many people have gone to Amazon in the last three months to buy a book? Okay. Um, how many people have bought a new book in the last three months? How many people have bought an out of print book in the last three months? <laughs> okay, that the demand, it's not by chance that they're out of print. Okay, we do believe that there's value here. And the reason they're out of print is because the, mark, the cost of delivery made it so it wasn't good economics because you had to print and you had to do all that. So we do think that there is value in these books because as you have digital distribution, you're able to provide them at a cost that makes it worthwhile. However, I think anyone who thinks that five years from now, what, where will 90% of the revenue in the book market be? Okay, it will be new books. And what people think of is, if I want to go buy a book, okay, they don't think I want to buy a book that was out of print in January of 2009. That's what I really want. And the reality is the book market, I think, is highly competitive. Um, you see right now all sorts of different people, both for electronic books and other things, and really the battle there is, you know, about new books. That's what most people read, are books that publishers will be publishing. So. Um, we're going to go ahead and do a number of uh, Q&A, so you can just identify yourself. And can, <clears throat> I have a bunch of questions. I'm Sally Lowenstein. I'm a small publisher. I'm also an author and illustrator. Uh, first, I'd like to note that I was never notified by Google in any way. I'm an active publisher in any way, form, or fashion about this. Um, and I know many other people who were not notified. If they were notified, it also may have been spam because a lot of the notifications came through the email, which is unreliable. Well, you um, should also, before you leave that, you know, there are certain typical ways in which class action notice is made. There were advertisements of this, full page ads published in newspapers, including yeah. the New York Times and Washington Post, in all the major magazines. Right. You know, we've been flagging this idea that there is a website that people can go to. Uh, I'm sorry that you seem to be still unaware of it, but it's No, no, I've been very aware of it because I belong to well, ALA and a lot of other oh, organizations, okay. but the implication was that and a huge effort had been made, and everybody knew about it, and that's simply not true. A lot of people don't. But, but you go um, on to the next question, because I think okay. you had some I have, I have several. Um, I was wondering why, as a rights holder, I need to opt into the settlement in order to see if I'm digitized, and I wondered why I have to opt into the settlement in order to comment to the judge, and I also wanted to ask about your well, let's, uh, just start with the well, those two things go together. Yeah, just to, you, um, actually, you can see if we're previously digitized without opt, without, you don't have to opt into the settlement. As you see whether or not you're digitized, you still have a choice 
of whether or not to opt out or not. So you don't have to opt in to find out if you're digitization. That is not what we're being told by the Authors Guild or any of the organizations. Okay, that's so, so uh, yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah. The other thing you should also know is that you don't have to opt into the settlement. You are either in the settlement okay. or not. If you're in the settlement, you have the choice to opt out. Okay. But you don't have to opt into the settlement. I do have one more question well, that I think well, is really well, important. Well, no, I, well, I, we're just going to come back, okay? I we can talk afterwards too. Go ahead. Well, I'd to the Policy Science Center. From my perspective as a local user in Montgomery County, Maryland, the best outcome would be for my public library system to negotiate with everybody in the, in the universe and pay all the fees that have to be paid, and then let me with my local library card, like everybody else in Montgomery County, have free access to a global universal library. Now my concern, why well, everything I'm hearing, is this is not a clear and simple pathway through our public library system that we've built in this country or in the world for that kind of outcome with, with them being agents for us and, and real, with real negotiating power. So that we use our public library cards and get free access to almost everything in a global universal library except maybe the latest mystery bestseller. So I wonder if you could comment on that, because it doesn't seem to me that free at maximum free access to the public in the Global Universal Library is really going to come out of this politically unless the public library systems have real clout and are part of the negotiating process as our agents as individual members of the public. There's too much atomization, it seems to me, of, of everybody as an individual in the consumer market, and I, that worries me as a model for, for a national solution or an international solution. Yeah, and, and I think that's a good question, and, and um, I think that, and I know Alan raised that as well about the public access to So, um, there's what... Yeah, but from my home, I mean... From yeah, I know, home. I know. I, that, I was going to get exactly to that issue. I was going to get exactly to that issue. Um, understand that in this agreement, we had to craft something that we felt worked now, but it is not necessarily felt that this is the be all and end all. Because in fact, it's very difficult to predict what markets will demand, what users will want, what libraries will want. So in fact, what is in the agreement to appropriately point out? With the public. With the public, yes. Well, then when I said the market, absolutely. That um, the agreement. Um, does now envision that we can sell an institutional subscription to public library, but currently the agreement does not give us authorization to allow remote access, okay? Um, it doesn't preclude that, because the whole point of building the registry as an, as an organization that can represent rights holders as opportunities present themselves, you know, that's one of the things that we certainly talked about, okay? Because you can certainly see their interest and the demand there you know, in terms of figuring out what that right solution is and what that market is, it was not something that we reached agreement on. Um, but I think, you know, you're articulating something that other people will articulate, that there will be demand in public libraries for finding some sort of um, feature like that. Other features that aren't in there today that, you know, people have talked about is consumer subscriptions or other things. And, you know, this is what we have today. Um, but the settlement agreement envisions the fact that the market will evolve over time and that there are opportunities for the registry. So I know it's not a complete answer, but it's not that we thought, boy, that's a ridiculous request. It was, you know, this is what we could reach agreement on at this point in time, but I think there's, you know, room for movement in the market. Yeah, so as far as this particular settlement, uh, so I mean, one thing to be clear about is that this is a, a lawsuit. You have three parties, the Authors Guild, the Association of American Publishers, and Google. So nowhere in that line with the word library or public interest group or any group that will represent the interests of the public generally. So the kind of outcome you're, you're hopeful for, suggesting, is not likely to emerge from this kind of agreement or settlement or, or whatever. So, so I think, I mean, we, we hope that well, for your vision too, uh, but more generally, of course, it's, it's an extraordinarily difficult problem because of all the different rights holders and ensuring that they, you know, that they get what they're, what they're, you know, what they're due in terms of compensation. And, uh, it's an incredibly complex problem. And as far as your, your local public library, uh, as you know, public libraries are local institutions, right? The public library is part of the city of some uh, Rockfield. Montgomery County. Montgomery County. You know, so they're city and county level institutions. So there isn't, so trying to get aggregation and cooperation is, and it's one of the things that we work on with the, the associations. 
uh, but they are fundamentally local institutions, so there are many, many challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So well, let me go to the other. I know there's. Right. Hi, Debbie Rose with the Association for Competitive Technology. Um, I want to know a little bit more about the ACT um, revenue, and um, do you guys really not have any plans to do targeted uh, marketing to folks for, that are using the system? And then are you also, just to clarify, you guys are keeping all of your ad revenue from the system? Yeah. yeah no. So the way it works is that um, the uh, ad revenue from the books, in fact, we currently display ads on the preview, that's shared with the same, it's actually 63% um, goes to them because it's confusing because it says 70-30 with 10% per cost, so forget about the math. 63% of the revenue goes to the, the, the rights holders. Um, and in terms of, you know, to be honest, I, I can tell you what advertising we're doing now on books, okay? And it's basically similar to the same thing that happens all over the web, that in fact it's uh, based upon either, you know, your query or upon content, and it's dominated by query in terms of, um, you know, the advertising that we put on the book, and that's what we've been doing, you know, for quite some time now, is it's content-based and um, query-based advertising. Yeah, we have one back here. Okay. Um, Linda Frew, I have a question for the Libraries Association and then just a very quick one for Mr. Clancy. Um, I'm interested that in your comments, especially the six points, they were so profound and wide, you know, broad, your concerns about the settlement. I'm wondering why the associations chose to ask for vigorous enforcement rather than to propose amendments or to challenge the, the, the settlement, since it does seem to violate some principles of public libraries. And then I just very briefly wanted to ask Mr. Clancy, do I understand correctly that a library that has purchased a book already and then made it available for free public access through the lending system and then has it scanned by Google, through this settlement has to pay again to provide access to that online by virtue of, of subscribing? Yeah, you raised, you raised the part of the, the agony that we, that we went through. So there, the, 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 the problem, the difficulty is, uh, so Peter articulated a lot of the larger vision and, and principles that we you know, largely share. Uh, but then, th then at some point the rubber meets the road. What are you actually going to do? And the judge really can't change the settlement. So you can ask for vigorous enforcement or you could intervene as you know, petition to become a party to the lawsuit. And we, we thought that we can get enough of what we wanted through vigorous enforcement. Uh, and also there's a practical matter of if you intervene, if you actually become a party, there are significant legal and financial responsibilities. And you know, library associations weren't ready to sign up to that kind of possibly very expensive uh, future responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So there was kind of a practical trade-off of, well, what are you really going to do? You know, we, Obviously, if we wrote the settlement, it would look a lot different, but we didn't, and we're not a party to it. And basically, the judge could say it's okay or it's not, and that was the trade-off that we faced. And, and going to the question, I mean, you know, in our deals with the libraries that are providing books, the settlement doesn't govern that contract. That contract is between us and the libraries, so it has nothing to do with the settlement per se. The fact that, in fact, what we are offering to the libraries, which you know, we've talked about publicly, is in fact with our library partners when they give us books to scan, Google is going to either give them one of two choices, either a discount on the subscription that we have to pay for out of our pocket. In other words, the rights holders, nothing comes out of the rights holders' pocket. It's that Google pays for it. Or there's something that we call a limited subscription, which is pretty simple. It says, if you give me the book library X and it's for sale in the institutional subscription, Google will pay to make sure your students have access to that book. Okay, pretty simple. So when UVA gives me 500,000 books, Google, for the length of this agreement, will pay the registry, the rights holders, so that we can um, allow students at UVA, if those books are used in the institutional subscription, so that they have access to those books. What was the length of it? What's the length of it? So it's the length of copyright law, which which some naysayers in the room would say eternity, but it is not. <laughs> but it is 70 years after the death of the author, so let's just say 100 years um, is how long copyright uh, may last for some of these works. But so it's as long as we're using these in a subscription. Yeah. 
I think we'll take one more question. We're almost out of time. Uh, go ahead and respond. I'm just one extra last now. In terms of the financial responsibility for participating, uh, my understanding is that the total legal fees associated with this lawsuit today exceed forty million dollars. So it's a non-trivial enterprise. Uh, I'm Scott Cleland, recursive. I'm just following up on an earlier question. You said, and I thought it was remarkable at the beginning. You said it's all about search and discoverability. Well, the question is, why is this agreement? The old, um, limit everyone else or deny everyone else the ability to search <laughs> and discover in orphan works this mm -hmm. unique this unique asset and what motive would there be for that denying of that access other than to extend a search monopoly yeah it, it doesn't deny that access it doesn't deny that access there, there's not an opportunity for other companies to come in and offer the range of services that Google would have the right to so, Yeah, so let's, to be clear that, you know, in other words, Google, again, strongly believes that, in fact, in this agreement, for rights holders going forward, in other words, we do pay money if we previously had scanned your book, but for rights holders going forward, they make money from selling their content, okay? So Google still believes that if someone wants to scan work and work to do search, I mean, they have to pay for the scanning. Right? But we fully believe in our action support that they should, they can do that. Yeah, but they would have to break the law in order to um, copy things under the under copyright and then hope they can get a settlement like you did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so I just, when you were talking about search, right, you know, in other words, when I, for search, okay, we, Google doesn't think they have to break the law out, right? Okay, but that for Orphan Works in particular, where there's nobody there, you know, the risk there, you know, we didn't get sued over scanning of Orphan Works. We got sued over scanning of publisher content and author's content and said that's my fault. So our lawsuit was nobody, no orphan rights holder sued Google. Okay, they were part of the class because you don't know who the orphan and then everyone's a class now. Um, okay, but so there's this circular thing there. But the important thing here is, you know, we don't see a problem with search and indexing uh, for that. And other people, they just have to do the scanning and, and the settlement doesn't allow for the registry to license that to other providers. And we just don't see that as being possible in the class action. Well, we're pretty much out of time. I'm going to uh, give Peter the last words if we didn't get any questions here. <laughs> Um, I just want to reiterate that uh, the archive feels, um, uh, for some of these reasons that were just articulated, that the best course of action is for us to pull out orphans uh, from the settlement. I thought it was particularly telling that um, Dan talked about uh, the competitive market for books and, and how um, you know, many of these orphans don't represent a significant amount of revenue. So it seems to me clear that, you know, that Google at least would, would not um, would not be uh, frustrated by the removal of orphans from the revenue uh, opportunities that the settlement provides. Uh, but we think that the clear path forward is to engage the legislative process, uh, the public process, uh, to determine and to try out the future for the use of orphan works and, and not to utilize the court sanctioned uh, approval of the private agreement. And, and to be clear, it's not the revenue, it's because we think they should be accessible. Yeah, I would also just point out that you know all of the libraries still own all of the books in their collection, and they have the ability to work out whatever arrangements they want to make to try to get those collections digitized by somebody else in order to be able to have uh, a different set of arrangements. What we're talking about here is something that arose uh, out of a lawsuit where, frankly, I didn't see Congress rushing in to protect the interests of publishers or authors. We had to go to court to do that. Uh, once we were in court and the authors brought their suit in the form of a class action mechanism, uh, the routes for us to try to resolve that litigation uh, were somewhat limited as well as somewhat expanded at the same time. And that's what's occurred here. But it doesn't preclude other activities, including legislation by Congress or other arrangements by the libraries with respect to their collection. Okay, great. Um, like any good debate, I think we could keep going for another hour or two. So uh, I know you're all anxious to do that. So I, I, I hope all our four speakers would uh, have a few minutes and stick around with people with questions and comments. Uh, just two other quick points. One is, uh, I know you can't get enough of this, so you can actually go home and tomorrow morning you can watch it again. Uh, it'll be on video. It might even be on Google Video. Who knows? Uh, it's probably be posted on YouTube. But I yeah, I'm going to do that tonight. Uh, although, actually, I don't think 
And second last, uh, if you can't get enough of IPI events, either in person or video, we're doing an event next Thursday at uh, 9 o'clock at our place. Really fascinating guy. If you've never seen him or heard of David Grin, who's a science fiction writer. If you ever saw the book, uh, if you've ever read the, saw the movie The Postman with Kevin Costner, uh, that was David's book. But anyway, David's really fascinating. Futurist and talked about his America lost its faith in the future uh, and, and raised, I think, a pretty provocative discussion. So uh, with that, please join me in, in thanking our four wonderful guests and our wonderful